but you are to pray for the gifts of the Spirit. So I did. This particular gift has helped me immensely. It's allowed me to understand things that are happening in the Spirit that I never could have seen with human eyes. And uh, I mean, I could give you numerous examples. I, the most recent example was, and you might say, well, that's a word of knowledge. That's not a gift of discernment, right? I have a gift of discernment. So I, I use it in this capacity. We were sitting in the Wins restaurant, and we were talking about ways that the man for Miss Carolina needs to step out and do some start feeding people. And so uh, one of the young men there was, was talking about the possibility, and the Holy Spirit, man, just began to surround me, and, and the presence of God came down. And I, I said, you know, I don't know where we're going with this, but I said, God's in this. And I said, we need to go down that path. So get us some information. Get back to us. How do we do that? What do we need to do? But this is, I really feel the presence of God just directing us down this, at least as an interim time. And so uh, that's one way that it works. Sometimes discerning has to do with just asking, is this God's plan for my life? Is this God's plan for the life of a church? Or is this God's plan for a family or a friend or a relationship? The answer to that alone should dictate the actions of all believers. Everywhere I've been a pastor, I knew that that's where God wanted me at that particular time. When I get a phone call from a DS, I would usually tell them immediately, well, I knew you were going to be calling, and yeah, I'll take it. Because I'd already heard from God before the DS called. And then there were times I would get a call, and I would think, that's weird. And they would say, I, we want you to do this. And I'd say, you know what, I'll pray about it, but I, I haven't heard anything. And God always lets me know ahead of time what's going on. So... Let me tell you, if you if you tell the back in the United Methodist Church, if you told them that you weren't going somewhere and they told you you were going, that, there were some awkward moments after that. Uh, they didn't like you to say, that's not of God, because uh, I've been told at one time, I was told, the cabinet's been praying about this, and we believe that God, this is God's move for you. To which my response was, well, it's not a good time for me, it's not a good time for the church, I don't believe it's of God, so are you telling me that I... I need to retire? What are, you, what are you telling me? Well, you're not you're not going to be appointed there anymore. And so at one point I said, well, I could retire. And he said, well, that, don't, don't do that. Let's see if you can find yourself a job somewhere that we can appoint you to. And maybe we'll do that. So that's what we did. So you see, when I started in ministry, I saw how the United Methodist Church did things. And I asked God to help me with one main problem I see that people, pastors in the Methodist Church, are tempted to. And that was escalating in their vocation, stepping up the corporate ladder. Financial reasons, there's a lot of different reasons to do that. But I say, God, don't ever let me get so attached that that's all I want, that's all I do. And that was the temptation in ministry for many. And so you never know what can, you would do for sure until you find yourself in a particular situation. You always hope you'll do the right thing, but you never know until you're really faced with it. Every decision you and I ever make is determined by a few things, very few things. One, what do I see in Jesus? Who do you say he is? What do you see when you look at Jesus, when you consider Jesus in your life? Who do you say he is? And the other thing that is very concerning and, and determines what you do is, what does Jesus see in you? Who are you in Christ? Who do you believe you are in Christ? Because that makes a huge difference in what you will or won't do for Jesus. And then you have to wonder as you get down this, what am I willing to do for Jesus? Those are all important questions. First of all, what do I see in Jesus? So what do you see when you look at Jesus? Do you see God? Do you, do you see the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have left receive cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor? What do you see when you think of Jesus? Maybe you see a cuddly little December baby in a manger. And someone that can be used to answer your prayers. Maybe you see a long-haired, bearded figure dressed in, in old robes from a picture you once saw. And you think of him as one, yeah, you might consider like an old family relative. What do you see when you look at the face of Jesus? If you don't see a Lord and Savior, nothing else I ever say or anyone else says is going to make a lot of difference in your life. If you, if you don't see the suffering servant, the Son of God, you're never going to be willing to do whatever he asks or says. And you'll remain lost in your sins and selfishness. And no one else can stop that. That's a, that's a possibility. 
But if you see Jesus as Lord and you're willing to follow him wherever he leads you, then you have another question. What does Jesus see in me? Who does Jesus say that I am? You might find that an odd thing to think about, but I found that this really gets to the heart of the matter very quickly. Because if you don't know who you are in Jesus, you're never going to serve God in the ways that he calls you to. If you go through life beating yourself up and saying, I'll never amount to anything, you'll never try to do anything for God. Some people use this technique to pretend to be humble so that they never really have to do anything for God. Regardless of why someone does it, this personal image can reduce you to utter uselessness for the kingdom. Adversely, if you know who you are in Christ and are willing to make a stand against the works of the enemy, you have great potential to be used of God in places that you never thought of going before. Places that God raises you into. So I ask you again, what does Jesus see in you? Does he see someone that is faking a relationship so they can be respected in their communities? Does he see someone that's a sinner? Extremely grateful that they've been forgiven and so in love with him that they will do anything he asks. Does Jesus see a person that meets him every morning and every evening to talk about the day and hear his words from Scripture? Or does Jesus see somebody that only calls on him when they need something? Does he see someone that has no idea who they are because they have no idea who he is? If you're someone that experiences the true love of Jesus, only then will you be able to give that love of Jesus to others. If you don't know Jesus intimately and daily, you, you'll not be able to serve him in any real capacity. Jesus has a better view of most people than most people have of themselves because he sees their potential. They can't see their potential because they don't believe what the word of God says about them. You, you are beautifully and wonderfully made. God didn't make junk. He made you. You have a purpose and a plan within you. But you need to get close enough to God to let him awaken that purpose in you and send you out into the world to do the things he's called you to do. But a poor view of Christ and a poor view of yourself will limit your ability to serve him and reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, if Jesus can use some stinking fishermen, he can use you too. So then the question is, what must I do? You need to make a plan. You start by reading the Word of God and believing it. The people of Jesus day had the prophetic words, not of a suffering, not only of a suffering servant, but where he would be born. The Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and said, Where is the, the king to be born? They said, In Jerusalem, in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, O uh, Jerusalem, the land of Judea, by far least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a son who will be the, the shepherd of my people Israel. They knew where he was to be born. The Pharisees and Sadducees told the Magi where to go. Did they go? No. Why not? They weren't looking. They weren't looking for Jesus. They had much. They had much. But they didn't have the Holy Spirit at work in them so that they could discern and see Jesus when he was standing right before them. Some people in today's culture prefer to believe lies when the truth can look them right in the face. Some people are so spite-filled that they believe lies rather than admit their unforgiveness and hold on to dearly to, your, to anger and spite. We, we have people so angry right now. So angry. And it's not just outside of the church. It's in churches. People are angry. We have a culture of anger all around us and hate and spite. And, and in the last week, it's caused, well, week and a half, it's caused two fatalities. One just outside of Manford, another one in Cleveland. There was a guy sh shot a cousin in Cleveland. Two fatalities here in our own area in the last week and a half. Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, spite. This unsolved anger, unresolved anger, carries over in many people's view of Jesus as well. And I know people that are so mad at God he didn't heal somebody they loved, and because of that, they're filled with spite, and they not only uh, won't submit to God again, but they've launched all out attacks on God for the rest of their lives. Ted Turner, the network executive, is one such person. Spent his entire life putting God down because God didn't heal his sister when she was sick when he was younger. He studied for ministry. He was in seminary. Our 
countries filled with people so full of hate for one person, they'd rather let the country go than get over their hate. Listen, church, we need to acknowledge our own areas of unforgiveness, whether they're towards God or towards people, and we have to turn loose of our personal rights if we're really going to serve Jesus. I've recited many times Paul's phrase that I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. And until we crucify our own flesh and forgive others, we will never be truly used to disseminate the love and grace of God. Jesus on the cross was able to say, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Stephen, as he was being stoned, the first martyr, forgive them, for they know not what And until we show that grace at work in us, we will never be a credible witness of what God's done for us. So you see, your image of Jesus is very important. Do you believe him when he says, if you forgive men their sins, God will forgive your sins? Do you believe him when he follows, if you don't forgive men their sins when they sin against you, God will not forgive your sins? Do you believe him? Do you see Jesus in the light of both Savior and Judge because that is who he is? Do you see yourself as someone that Jesus would call a friend? Jesus said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love hath no one in this, to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I've made known to you. Now that you're going to do, what are you going to do with that? You know that. Now what are you going to do with it? What will you do with your vision of Christ, his truth, and his desire to elevate you? Doing nothing is an option, but I'm not sure it's a good one. Jesus calls each of us to have a personal relationship with him, and then he sends us out to reach a dying world for the saving grace of his gospel. You have to admit the suffering servant gave his entire life to this cause, reaching people with the gospel message. What will we do to show our appreciation for that amazing grace? It all depends on what you see when you look in the face of Jesus. For some of you, that idea brings overwhelming joy, and for others, it brings fear. You might be here thinking about, you know, I'm a sinner, and God could, could have, have a way to use me, but let me tell you something. Jesus is the refiner of human hearts. He's like the refiner of gold and silver. He can take whatever vessel is dirty and make it clean. He places us in a crucible called life, and he turns up the heat, and he turns us into a place where we become molten metal in that crucible. And he allows the sin and the dross to come to the surface, and he gives the crucible a little shake. And the sin and the dross is moved to the side and sticks to the crucible, and then he casts us into that shape uh, that he created us for, to be in after he sees the gold and the silver in his pure form. You see, there's something about the working of metal that you may not know. When you're refining metals, or when you are casting metals, when you look in the precious metals, and you look down in there, there is a dross that comes to the top. It's the impurities, and they come to the top, and it's nasty looking. It just it's almost looks the evil just kind of bubbling in there. And if you'll put a little flux, or you'll take that crucible and shake it a little bit, that dross will go to the side of the crucible. And when you look down, you will actually see your own reflection in the metal. That's when you know it's time when you see yourself. Jesus is refining us. Yeah, life's bad. Life gives problems. Life gives heartache. Life gives trouble. He's refining us. And he's waiting to see himself so that he can turn us into something far more beautiful than we've ever been. He doesn't ever stop helping us grow in perfection, to grow in his desire for our life, but he has to see his own image first. He can do it for you if you let him. If you'll submit your whole being to him, he can and will help you to remove the sin and the dross from your life so that when others look at you in the ministry God's prepared for you, they will see Jesus and not you. I must decrease that he may increase. Maybe you're here, maybe you're at home watching and you're late in life, but let me assure you, it's never too late for God to give you eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to you. Asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking the door will be opened unto you. I pray that you see Jesus, him crucified, dead, and buried, and most importantly, risen from the dead. 
the very Son of God, so that you can make Him Lord of your life, and so that you can become what He sees in you. He's the author and perfecter of our faith, but we have to let Him.